Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this uh, Facebook Live broadcast of Crossroads Assembly of God. I'm Pastor yes. Joel Pledge. It's my wife, Linda. We're glad to be uh, <laughs> coming to you today. We're going to encourage you and challenge you today in the Word of God, but we're praying that God will be uh, will bless you in all that is said and done today. Um, uh, let me uh, begin with a reading of the Word of God today, Psalm 29. Honor the Lord, you heavenly beings. Honor the Lord for his glory and strength. Honor the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord echoes above the sea. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty sea. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord splits the mighty cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon's mountains skip like a calf. He makes Mount Hermon leap like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with bolts of lightning. The voice of the Lord makes the barren wilderness quake. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists mighty oaks and strips the forest bare in his temple. Everyone shouts, Glory! The Lord rules over the flood waters. The Lord reigns as king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with peace. Amen. Amen. That's a great introduction to just the word of exhortation that the Lord has put in my heart. Uh, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, how powerful and impactful and life transforming the voice of the Lord is. Um, I'm coming from an unusual scripture this morning. Um, you don't hear a lot preached on uh, the Song of Solomon. It's an oriental love poem, but it's an allegory. And it and it really is um, little pictures like cameos of uh, a relationship between a king and his soon-to-be wife. You know, we are espoused to Jesus, who is our bridegroom. We are in covenant with him. We are waiting for that final consummation in the marriage supper of the Lamb in our future as we, um, as he comes for his church, his bride. And so we are living now in um, promised but, but not fulfilled um, time while we sojourn on the earth. And this is a powerful um, piece of literature. It's a poem and I, it's, it's full of visual imagery and um, allegoric, uh, metaphorical speech, but it opens up. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about chapter five. I could go on and on about this, but I've, I've done a whole ladies retreat on um, this, but I'm going <laughs> to give one little piece that I think is which is what first um, opened me up to the revelation that's really in the, this, these sections, this section of scripture. And that's in Song of Solomon, chapter 5. It opens in verse 2. And here is the, actually the Shulamite woman. And she is the one who is promised to the king, although she was a child, a young uh, girl when this happened. So um, verse 2, she is telling her story. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drop of the night. What a beautiful picture. Here is um, this woman. She is um, sleeping. But even while she's sleeping, her heart is awake to hear the voice of her beloved. And she hears a knock. And in this little poem, he is standing outside her door and he's knocking. And it's at night. He's dripping with the dew of the night. And he is knocking um, and asking for her to open up the door. And isn't that a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit? Because we have a relationship with this bridegroom through the Holy Spirit. And he is speaking to us. And his voice is going forth. And he is knocking on the door of your heart, your inner self, your real 
person inside you that's housed in this body of flesh. He is calling. He is knocking. And you hear his voice. And then it comes in verse 3, which is kind of surprising in this poem. But she starts with how she's feeling and kind of like her excuses. Because she says, oh, I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? Oh, go and open that door. I have washed my feet. How am I going to defile them again? I wanted to go through all that ritual again. And then she hears in verse 4, she hears her beloved put his hand on the door again, the latch on the door. And and then she said, oh, well, she goes, my heart yearned for him. In other words, okay, well, I'll go open it up. Finally, your heart responds. Now, we don't know how much time is um, passed here, but in verse 5, she says, I rose to open for my beloved in my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid liquid myrrh on the hands of the lock when she went to the door she and opened it up she saw that her hands were covered with the with this liquid myrrh but he was gone she said my beloved had turned away and was gone this image in my head this picture in my head so impacted me because Jesus is coming to us full with his hands full of the dew of God dripping with the myrrh of his presence the blessings the richness of his insight wisdom and revelation that he has to impart to us just the love that he's desiring to give to us to just enshroud us in the very love of God and to fill our lives with the riches of his glory. He comes dripping with dew and full of this this myrrh of God. And we have turned him away. He, He comes to us like this. And we've made our excuses. Haven't we all done this? When we feel the Holy Spirit sort of tug on our hearts and say, you know, I'd like to have time with you. I miss you. I have something to say to you. I have, we, we get too comfortable. We go, oh, no, I got to sleep in. I want to sleep in. We have other plans at this time. This is, mm, no, I've got, I've got my agenda. When he desires to spend time with us. And you know what? You miss that moment. You miss that impartation for that particular time. Verse 6. I just want you to remember that you are more than just a body. You are spirit. That which is born of you is born of God and desires to commune with God. You are more than just a body to keep comfortable and to keep fed and to keep entertained and to keep rested. Um, You are, you have a soul and a spirit. And then in verse 6, She says, my heart, she's remembering, my heart leaped up when he spoke. Haven't you had those times when you've been in his presence and something that you've read in his word just came alive and spoke to you? This is what she's describing. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I looked for him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. There is a spiritual dynamic in your relationship with the Lord. The Bible says when you seek after him and when you pursue him with your whole heart and with all your strength, mind, and soul, when you are running after him and desiring his presence and your ears are open to hear what he has to say, then that's that's relationship. And there's a spiritual dynamic. When you have that desire, when you have that, that um, pursuit, then he comes. He responds to that. And when there is no desire, and when there is no running after him, there's no revelation. You've missed it. And it's a, it's a push and a pull in our relationship with God. And um, sometimes we get too comfortable. We don't want to be inconvenienced. Um, and we remember when our heart leaped up when he spoke. The timing of the Lord is perfect. His word and his voice will go out. He desires that voice to do something. He has something to say to you. 
He has something to impart to you and to give to you. He has a, a transformative work to do in you. He has such a desire for you to come to him so that he can he can bless you. He's a generous God. He comes full of the myrrh and the dew of his presence. Don't miss your moment, church. You have the things of God are timed perfectly. And sometimes we miss the moment. It won't come in that same way ever again because he's moved on. So it's a, it's a dynamic relationship. It's not a static one. It's about him and the timing of the Lord and feeling responding to that tugging in your heart. He loves you so much with an everlasting love, and he wants you to walk in it. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord in uh, one of my favorite uh, song selections, Jesus yes. Messiah.
I want to turn your attention to the Word of God this morning. I am stuck in 1 Peter chapter number 1. And uh, verse, uh, verse uh, chapter 2 and verse 21, um, it's uh, for me, uh, for, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example and you must follow in his steps. Amen. Well, um, what does it mean to follow follow Christ? I may just throw a few things out there to you. And, and uh, again, this is one, I, uh, one of those things of maybe having fun. I don't know. Uh, what does it mean to follow Christ? Well, you know, for some people, it's just going to church. I'm following Christ. I go to church. Uh, I learn a little bit from the sermon. Maybe I'll forget it by uh, Tuesday afternoon. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go to church. For other people, it's a it's a life of prayer. Maybe even a prayer and fasting, something that we do on a regular basis. Every day we're gonna pray. We're gonna fast. Uh, the Jews in Jesus' day like to fast once a week, at least sometimes twice. If you're really really holy. Others will call it the Word of God. Oh, well, I'm reading my Bible. I'm studying. I'm, I'm uh, participating in small groups. This proves that I am a follower of Christ. Well, there's a, a lot of different things that come to, come to bear upon us as we talk about this meaning of, what it, of, of following Christ. You know... Uh, John says this, or Jesus says this in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. And um, he says this, he says, Now I am giving you a new commandment, a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove, let's see which way I need to go, that to the world that you are my disciples. Oh, well, that's a powerful verse of scripture. Jesus doesn't say to them, you'll prove your discipleship or you'll prove that you're my follower by going to the synagogue or by praying three uh, every day, three times a day, or fasting three times a week. That's more than the Pharisees required. He didn't say to them that they must become students of the Torah to memorize the Old Testament book, first five books uh, to memory, uh, memorize it. He says to them, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If I ask the question of what is the basis of this command, what is the basis of this command? The first thing that I would point out to you is, is that, well, this is how Jesus loves. Jesus loves because as he loves us, we are to love others. I think as well, he, he may say to us, um, I, I love you and my love for you should free you to be able to love others. Okay. So it's what Jesus has done for us. He has loved us. We love others. It's also true that the second basis of that command um, is that the Father, okay, the Father has loved us. This is how the Father has loved Jesus. Okay. Well, let me let me get there. I, uh, my. Uh, My, my slide went in reverse instead of forward. I couldn't figure it out. It says in John 15, verse 9, he says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. You ever heard those words before? In other words, Jesus says, I've experienced the love of my Father, and now I'm just loving you with that same love. The way I was loved, I'm going to love him. I am going to love him. I'm going to love you. This is so important because uh, we see that the Father's love for Jesus is, is measureless. How at this point of the story, we can't see it. Okay? 
At this point of the story, we, we can't see it directly because the, the, the measureless love of God the Father for the Son is really going to be seen in the resurrection of Christ, that he will not allow him uh, to remain in death, that he's going to give life to him, a resurrection body, a, a place at his right hand, a name that is above every name, uh, every name, every, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what the Father did for him. He gave him that name. He gave him all rule and authority and power and placed all things under his feet. Okay? All things under his feet. So I know that the Father loved the Son dearly without measure. He held nothing back. I want to add to this, to this idea and understanding from the Messianic Psalm number 2, Psalm 2 and verse 8 says, Only ask and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance mm -hmm. and the whole earth as your possession. Okay? So in that relationship, the Father asked the Son for the universe or for the whole earth. He knew that asking for that inheritance meant going to the cross, being obedient unto death. The promises of John 15 are clearly seen, okay? As we follow Christ, as we are obedient to the commands, we remain in his love, then a whole new range of possibilities open us, uh, 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 possibilities with God open for us. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is and what he's called us to do, Jesus followed, follows the example of the Father. He loved the way the Father loved him, and in doing so, the Father rewarded him. Let me tie a couple of verses together. Um, first off, you, you have John 15, 8. He says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, and this brings much glory to God. Fruitfulness implies ministry. Okay, it just it implies service. I've I'm a branch on that vine. What's in that uh, in vine is coming to me, and it produces fruit in my life. I'm enabled to minister. I'm enabled to serve. Whatever we see Jesus doing, we should be able to do. If we see Jesus serving others, we ought to be able to serve others. If we see Jesus loving others, then we ought to be able to love others. If we see Jesus obeying the Father, even though it uh, leads to suffering and pain, then we should be able to obey the Father. The next verse, the verse previous to this, is a promise verse, one of the great promises that Jesus gives to us. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. You say, where does Jesus get that teaching? I mean, he just kind of throws that out there. What a great promise. Well, it's because of the way the Father has treated him. The Father has loved him. The words of the Father have remained in him. The love of the Father has remained in him. Jesus obeyed to the detriment of his own life. And yet he asked, Father, give me the nations for my inheritance this whole earth for my possession, and the Father did. And so Jesus simply says to us, I followed the Father in, 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 in his example. Now you follow me in my example, and the same things are going to take place. You see that parallel? That's a powerful parallel. Uh, you, you know, we do a lot of things. Oh, you got to have faith, or you got to be a living right, or you got to be this or that. I think that you follow in his steps. You follow the steps of Jesus. You do what Jesus did in his relationship with the Father, and these things will come to pass for us. The Father loves the Son. He answers his request. The Son loves the disciples. The church, <laughs> he loves his church, and he answers their request. The Father that gave all things unto Jesus promises to treat us in the same way if we truly follow Christ. Well, let me make it a little bit harder and let me take it one step further. Peter, in our verse, is calling us to follow in the steps of Christ. Jesus is loving as the Father has loved him. We see this. Well, um, 
Jesus is highlighting that that principle. Then how the how God has treated us is how we are to treat others. How God has treated us, that's how we are to treat others. We know the golden rule. Everybody knows the golden rule. Um, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, that's a good rule, and that's a powerful statement. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that there's an underlying statement that's even a greater, uh, a, I think, a greater call for us, and that is how, what God has done for you, you go and do for others. What God has done for you, you go and do for others. Have you been loved by God? Well, then go love others. Have you been forgiven by God? Then, hey, go and forgive others. Remember, um, um, remember the parable that Jesus gives about the, about the, um, <laughs> what, it, what was that, 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 um, that unforgiving servant, you know, he, he, he owed billions of dollars, more money than he get ever pay back in a lifetime. And he goes to the, goes to the banker or whoever he owes the money to. I, we'll call him a banker. And he says, oh, you know, just give me time. Just give me time. I'll pay it back. I'll pay it back. And he's never going to pay it back because there's not enough time in the universe to pay back what he owes. So the banker just simply says, oh, I'm just going to forgive it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. I, he's not a very good banker because he, he needs to get something out of the deal. But for the sake of the story, he forgives the man more money than he'd ever make in a lifetime. Well, the man goes, he leaves that uh, audience with the banker and he goes down to uh, somebody he loaned 20 bucks to. And he says, hey, man, where's my 20? The guy says, oh, you know, I don't have it today, but I'll, I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you. I promise. I promise. And, and as in those days, you could throw a man in jail for the debt. And so and he says, hey, I'm just going to throw you in jail waiting. And, and, and as soon as you pay me, I'll get you out. Of course, when the master heard this about this unforgiving servant, he says, hey, I'm going to throw you in jail until you, until you pay me back. That whole parable is about forgiveness. That as God has done for you, you do for others. God loves you. Go love others. God has forgiven you. Go forgive others. God has been kind to you. Go be kind to others. Okay? Well, Paul teaches the this same, this same idea as, as he says to us to imitate God. To imitate God. Now, that's John. He says, uh, he says, well, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well, all kinds of evil behavior. That's some good advice there. He gives the instead. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. What has God done for you? You go do to others. If you'll do that, then these bitterness, rage, and anger, and harsh words, they'll all be gone because they cannot exist with forgiveness. He goes on in chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2 says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice at, for us, a pleasing aroma to God. What a powerful set of verses. Paul in these verses is simply saying, God, God is our heavenly father and we are his children. And As all children imitate their parents, then we should imitate God. It's a very powerful thing. Whatever you see in Christ, our elder brother, you go and do. That principle is found throughout Scripture. It's, through, it's, it's, it's a foundational principle. What God has done for us, go and do for someone else. You know, in Matthew um, chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus goes through the Torah. He goes through six commands of the Scripture and he begins with, uh, thou shalt not murder, and he'll talk about adultery, he'll talk about uh, divorce, and that's not in, yeah, that's in the Torah, divorce and the giving of vows, making of vows, and he'll end up on the, the command to love your neighbor. 
And um, let me let me show it to you and read it to you. It says this: "But you have heard how it was said how, that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you." In that way, you will be acting as your true children of your Father in heaven. There again, same thing that Paul did, Jesus does. For he gives, this is what God does, he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. And if you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even the corrupt tax collectors do that much. (laughs) If you're only kind to your friends... How are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, there again we have that calling, that principle, the perfection of the Father we are to follow. Okay? It can be viewed as a command, it can be viewed as a prophecy, it can be viewed as a as uh, um, as a promise, okay? Um, um, he, he can be commanding you to be perfect. He can be promising that you will be perfect, or he can be uh, he can be um, prophesying in the future that it will take place on the day of judgment. But listen, let me tell you something. This passage of scripture has confounded. The, study, the students of the word for generations upon generations. I want to I want to emphasize two things this morning in this verse, and that is, first of all, that the command is to follow the Father in heaven, His example, how He treats people, how He loves people. That's the example that you're to follow. Now, this this fits very nicely into Peter's command to follow in the footsteps of Christ. The command we hear of loving your enemies on on one level for us, practically impossible to fulfill. But this is how God acts in his creation. He loves his creation. He loves us. And so he is, he is calling us, leading us, giving us an example of how and to whom we love. Secondly, I believe that this is the ultimate expression of the love of God. The ultimate expression. God loves the world even though some of the world will never love him in return. We know John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay? That he gave. He so loved the world. Uh, He knows that some part of that world, some part of that creation, his the human race will never love him. Matter of fact, he loves them even though he knows that some of them will not even acknowledge that he exists, much less that he's a neutral figure out somewhere in space I don't want to love. They'll just say he doesn't exist. You know, on the other hand, very few of us in the church today, you're listening, we ever consider that we were once enemies of God. We never look at each other and say, oh, well, uh, there's that one-time enemy of God over there. You know, that that deacon, that he was one time, he was an enemy of God. No, 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 we, we just don't think that never crosses our mind. We don't say of our, of our, of our uh, fellow church members, oh, who does she think she is? One time she was an enemy of God, now she thinks she's really something. We just don't think in those terms, do we? I've never thought in those terms in my life. We think of our, ourselves as bound or deceived or uh, a sinner, ignorant of God's command or, or uninformed. <laughs> we don't think of ourselves as the enemy of God. But let me share with you from Romans, Romans 5 this morning. Romans 5. I love this verse. It's one of my favorites. Verse 8, 5, 8, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Amen? 
We can say amen to that. God has demonstrated his love for us. We know God loves us because Christ died for us. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. We know that that's true, that in the future, condemnation and the future judgment will be free because God sent Jesus to die for us. Verse 10 says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his Son, while we were still sinners... Oh, no, that's not what it says. While we were still his enemies. Uh, I'm going to let that sink in because that, that needs to sink in. That needs to sink into your, in, into your spirit. Since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved by the life of his son. He concludes this, but now we can rejoice in the wonderful new relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. I love Romans 5, 8, one of my favorite verses. I acknowledge my sin. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I acknowledge my sin. I rarely read into verse, verse 10 where it says, while I was still a, 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 an enemy. You know, I, I was raised in the church. Uh, when, when was I an enemy of God? I, I, I've been to going to church my entire life. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I, I know I've failed God. I, I know I'm imperfect. But when was I ever, ever a, a, an enemy of God? I, 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 well, it's just true. Whenever I was a sinner, I was an enemy of God. Whenever I was... A sinner, I was in rebellion against God's plan in my life. I, I was the enemy of God. I was serving myself and not serving Him. I, I was serving sin. And in all those times, I was an enemy of God. And, and pardon me, but so were you. And yet God loved us and still loves us. He loves His enemies. And Jesus calls upon us to follow in his footsteps. You know, if I look at how the church has dealt with this scripture through the ages, then I find that, you know, it is one of those verses that are just kind of hard or impossible to obey. Let me just run through these just so that you'll have some historical context. Okay? Clement, who was one of the early church fathers, he died in the year 99. He knew Paul, knew, knew John, perhaps. He says, whoever does not love the one who hates him is not a Christian. Very powerful statement. He, he wrote that. He preached that. But that didn't stay around very long because it's so hard to fulfill. You see, by, by a, a couple hundred years down the road, Origen would write or explain that the love of the enemies is different than love of friends and family. There's a qualitative difference. By the time we get to Augustine, some 400 years later after Christ, the command, he says, is for the perfect sons of God. The faithful, the rest of us, should strive to attain it, but it's not going to happen. It's only for those who are perfect, those perfect sons of God. Well, you can see that over time, the, the verse becomes superfluous. It becomes something that we cannot do, so we ignore it's, it. it we, we don't examine. We don't examine. It becomes, it becomes that ideal thing that is impossible. I grew up listening to the testimony of Corey Tim Boom, Billy Graham film, the book, The Hiding Place. If you don't know the story, it, it's, uh, it's a great read. It's something that you need to, to check in on. She was uh, a Christian who lived in the, in the Netherlands, Holland, and, and during the World War II, she hid Jews in her house, and uh, her and her sister uh, were captured or, or discovered by the Nazis, and they sent them to a concentration camp. And there her sister Betsy died, and, and she was later released and preached the gospel around this world. 
She says in 1947, she was preaching in a church in Munich, and she was preaching on forgiveness. She said it was easy for us uh, Hollanders to, to, to visualize because they lived right there on the, on the sea and on the ocean. And she says, you know, when God forgives you, he, he throws that sin into the deepest part of the ocean. It's gone forever. Wow, what a beautiful image. She says as she preached in 1947 to the Germans there that they were all just, they just sat in silence. It was a hard message to receive. People stood in silence. People left in silence. They never asked a question. They never were excited about what God had spoken. But then one in one meeting, she said she saw a man coming forward to talk to her that she recognized. She recognized. She says it all came back to her in a rush. A huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form in front of me, the ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. She says, Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man, the man coming towards her, had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. She says, and I, who had fumbled, spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than to take his hand. He would not remember me, she said. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It, had been a th it was the first time since her release that she had been face to face with one of her captors. And she says, my blood seemed to freeze. The man says, you, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was a guard there. And since that time, I've become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, again his hand, waiting, will you forgive me? She said she stood there. I, whose sins had every day been forgiven, she could not move her hand. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking? It could not, it could not have been many seconds that he stood there, his hand out. But to me, it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. And I had to do it. I knew I had to do it. The message that God gives about forgiveness is that we forgive those who have injured us. Because if you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. She says, I knew the commandment of God. I knew it as a daily experience. She says ever since the end of World War II, she had had a, a Bible study in her home for the victims of, 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 Nazi, of the Nazi brutality. And she led them to forgive. She says those who were able to forgive their enemies were also able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives no matter how, what the physical scars were. Forgiveness brought freedom. She says, on the other hand, those who nursed their bitterness remain invalids. It was as simple as, and, and as horrible as that. Don't forgive, 
If you remain in that bitterness, that anger, that depression, you don't function in life. So there she stood that day. Her heart frozen. No warmth, no love towards this man. But she says, I understood that forgiveness is not an emotion. It's an action. It's an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. So she cried out to Jesus. She said, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. That's all I can do. You've got to supply the rest. You've got to supply the, free, the feeling. So woodenly and mechanically, she lifted up her hand and she stretched out his hand to take his. She says, right then, a miracle happened. A current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my entire being, bringing tears to my eyes. I said, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. You know, her story, I, I picked that up in the Guidepost uh, uh, website. It goes on to tell that she thought that by forgiving this man, this tremendous sin, that all other acts of forgiveness would be easy. But she found that with every act of forgiveness, that she had to once again to pray it through, to bring it to the Lord and release it to him. I believe if I can bring a little bit of clarity to that command to love your enemies, I want to do so by looking at Peter. You see, Peter wrote those words, follow in his steps, and Jesus loved his enemies as well as the Father loves his, his enemies. Jesus forgave those who, who crucified him. It's an amazing thing. But let's look in Peter's life, because I believe before he came to Christ, we know that he was a successful, successful um, fisherman, and he had partners, and he had a house, he had a family, and, and I'm sure that he had heard that command that he would say uh, to the fisherman, <laughs> yeah, that's an impossibility, it's not going to happen. I'll love him all right, as soon as I get finished beating the fool out of him, I'll love him then, but not before. That's the sinner, Peter talking. Yet when he became a disciple of Christ, we see him struggling in his own strength. I believe he lived by the power of that vision of that coming kingdom, wanting it to come, striving, wanting to be a part of it. And I believe he understood the command, and I, I believe he would say, I will do my best. I will do all that I can. I may not be able to do it all the time, but I'm going to do the best I can by my self-discipline and moral courage. I'm going to live this command. And kind of like Augustine, it's for those who can, the perfect sons of God and the rest of, you know, don't worry about it. It's for the missionaries and the pastors and the super spiritual ones. And, and the rest of you can breathe a sigh of relief because, you know, it doesn't apply to everyone. Well, after the cross, after his betrayal of Jesus, after his restoration, and after his transformation by the Holy Spirit, I believe that Peter would say, I will live this command by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, He was testifying before the, the Sanhedrin one time, uh, the Jewish leadership of the day after a miracle had taken place. And they looked at Peter and John, and they, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. And man, I, I, I put that in bold type so you could see it plainly. They had been with Jesus. You and I have to understand that Peter's testimony would be, I've been with Jesus. What Jesus has done for me, I'm going to do for others. What Jesus shows me, showed to me as how he lived, that's how I'm going to live. I'm going to follow in his steps. And he was following in as he as Jesus follows in his father's steps. 
And I believe that that's what he's saying in 1 Peter. Follow in his steps. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. I will follow in his steps. And yes, that means respecting everyone. That means loving the family of God. Also loving our enemies. Fearing God. Respecting the King. We all are invited, commanded to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who was following his Father. And though it seems impossible at times to follow them, it's not. Father, I give you praise this morning, and I just ask that you make real to our hearts the words of Scripture today, those things that are impossible for us. May they be possible through you. Oh God, work in our lives. Give us a heart of love and of forgiveness, of blessing. If there are those who are in those difficult circumstances, those different difficult relationships, Father, I'm praying that you will work in the heart of those who need to love and those who need to forgive. That God, that that love that you share with them will be transformative in their lives. I give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. It's been really good to be with you today. We uh, will have these things loaded up on our website, uh, craganline.com. Also, on uh, you can view this on uh, CRAG Teaching Fellowship on YouTube. We love you. God bless you.